morning. Good morning. How many of you have not heard the soul talk that we do here yet? Okay, it's good. <laughs> Lots to go over today. So, um, the main thing we're going to, well, the main point we want to make is the nursery industry right now, and for the last 20 years really, has been doing everything wrong, and they still continue to do it, but we're not sure when it's going to change. Uh, so in the nursery industry, what is considered good soil is, looks like this. This is ground up compost, which is essentially is a dead rotten plant. It's a plant that's been sitting in a compost pile, let it rot for a while, put it in a bag, tell you this is good dirt. Uh, we'll explain to you that sandy loam is perfect soil, and there's a big difference between these two. So, um, and the nursery industry, I don't know, I've talked to a lot of people at the very top of the industry, you know, the national publishers, and they don't get it. They've been told so long now that, you know, the last two generations of nurserymen that have gone through college have been told that this is what plants grow in, not this. Now, fortunately, the agricultural side of our industry knows that this is perfect soil. You ask the farmer, this is what he wants. This is perfect soil for growing plants. This to them is deadly. And we don't know why the two don't get together and, and talk about this, but uh, it's been going on way too long. So, first thing we'll mention is what do plants want from the soil? What roots want? Well, number one, and this is easy to figure out, it's moisture retention. So the soil's got to hold moisture. Um, now, one thing to know, too, is that, like when I was growing up, when they do a diagram of a plant or a tree, say, they did it all wrong. They didn't realize what was going on here. So trees, you know, say a tree that's 30 foot tall, Typical root system on the tree would be about one foot deep and about 50 to 80 foot across. When I was growing up, they made the root look like a mirror image at the top. But we know that's not right because number two of what they need is oxygen. Roots actually have to breathe air, oxygen. Uh, now, on a plant, the foliage makes oxygen, but that's the only part of the green parts plant create the oxygen, everything else in the plant uses oxygen, just like we do too. To live, we've got to burn oxygen to create energy, or to, to burn the sugar to make energy. And so the only parts of the plant that make the oxygen are the green parts. The roots have to breathe oxygen to survive. So that's why plants grow roots so shallow. A foot deep in the city is about normal. Uh, because they need oxygen. So number one, moisture, number two, oxygen. Now, I used to write number three, nutrition, but it ain't true. <laughs> the soil is not, you know, the soil for a plant is like your home for you. You don't eat your house. You live in your house. Your house provides you insulation, and it brings you water, takes away the sewage, it stores things for you, but you don't eat your house. So we take the nutrition out of it. I'm number three, I would say next most important is insulation. Because roots don't like to be above 85 or below freezing. And generally in the lower 48 states in the United States, the soil does not get above 85 degrees unless it's bare, which it normally shouldn't be, or below it doesn't freeze on us unless you're on one of the taller mountains. So the roots have to be insulated. Number three is insulation. Four, they do need to be stable. I mean, the soil is as soft as marshmallows, and the tree would fall over. So it's got to be, has, you know, plants get stability from the soil, too. But that's pretty much it. Next week, we'll go over where the nutrition comes from. But the nutrition actually. What plants do is they recycle the nutrition from dead leaves. Most of them, majority of plants in nature, I guess about 95% of them, just 
live off the minerals that are recycled from the dead leaves and sit on top of the ground. They don't get the nutrition from the dirt. Yet, almost all the potting soil manufacturers will tell you their soil is highly nutritious. Well, uh, it's not so, you know, they're, they're making a fertilizer. They're not making dirt, they're making fertilizer. And you're trying to grow plants and fertilizers that work very long. This is not the, and in fact, they left out a whole step. So just to be quick, what happened in the nature, the dead leaves fall on the ground, dead branches, dead things fall on the ground. And that is where the fungus lives. Fungus, bacteria, cull bugs, worms, earthworms, they all live in that area, that's their home. And then when the fungus and the bacteria get through with it, the minerals from that go to the plants. Well, the plants can't live in the dead plants. It's not their home. You make this, try to make this your home, you get, you know, this is better to grow mushrooms in than it is to grow plants. You put a plant on this, it wants to do the same thing this stuff is doing, it's rotting. So everybody's telling you you're overwatering your plants. Well, it's just, they're growing in the wrong stuff. If you grow a plant in this, there's no way it's going to rot. There's nothing here that causes rot. And it's not water. That's the, that's the biggest problem we have. If your soil, if your container has holes at the bottom, there's no way you can overwater it unless the soil is totally wrong. The water drains right out. Uh, what causes the symptoms of overwatering? The plant turns yellow, the roots are rotting. Uh, so the plant turns yellow. Uh, it's like it's got no fertilizer because what happens first, if, you, if the, the roots are dying, it's usually the feeder roots that die first, so they can't pick up any nutrients. The plant's going ugly on you, and that's the symptoms of overwatering. But it shouldn't be called overwatering, it should just be called root rot. And root rot doesn't happen from water. So one of the plants one of the, the, the crop that suffers from overwatering the most in agriculture is the avocado orchard. So they need what is called good drainage. Because if the water sits too long, you know, water out of the tap or out of the irrigation has enough oxygen in it to support root health. You know, we can't breathe in water, but fish can and and plants can. There's our tap water, you know, that comes through the tap has got to be oxygenated. I mean, the water district knows they have to oxygenate it so they don't kill everything. Um, you know, if you have recycled sewage water, that water is really low in oxygen for all that biological activity going on in the water. So they have to, you know, spray it up in the air and get the oxygen back in before they pump it back into the ground, or else they're going to cause everything in that area to die off. Not enough oxygen in the water. So our tap water generally has between six and eight parts per million of oxygen in the water. So that means uh, out of every million water molecules, and this may be you know, 10 billion water molecules, there are six to eight parts of oxygen in there, and that's adequate for plant roots to breathe. Now, uh, some plants can breathe as low as three parts per million, but you get down to two parts per million, you start losing your roots. Roots just start suffocating and dying. <coughs> So avocados, they say they need good drainage, but almost everyone in this room, I'm sure, has grown an avocado pit in a glass of water. There's no drainage in there. That's just pure water. But because it's clean water, and it's got access, you know, you, don't, you didn't cover the top of the water with anything, then that water circulates in the glass, it replenishes the oxygen as the roots use it up, there's no problem with that. In the ground, if the water sits there for weeks on end and doesn't move anywhere, then the water, the oxygen level gradually drops as the roots use it up, and the other soil organisms use it up too. And then the roots start suffocating. That's why they need good drainage. If the water doesn't drain away within a few days, then that water starts losing its oxygen. Then they get overwatered. This plant should never get overwatered unless the soil is really, really bad, and that's the case. Uh, they're throwing us plants in compost. Compost uses oxygen like crazy. You know, I've been told by, I've had arguments with some people, they tell me that we just sell finished compost. Well, finished compost is carbon dioxide and water. 
when things finish breaking down, that's what they become, carbon dioxide and water. There's no such thing as a bag full of finished compost unless it's just water and carbon dioxide. This stuff will continue breaking down until it reaches that state, even though it's not as fast as it was when they initially threw this stuff together. It's still decomposing. You throw this in a uh, container of water, and within a week, that water, within actually three or four days, that water is going to stink like a sewer mm -hmm. because it's used all the oxygen up in that water. It's 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 taking the oxygen out faster than the surface can replenish it. The biological activity here is so high compared to roots that it stills all the oxygen out of the water and that water turns like a sewer. Sewers smell like that because they're decomposing anaerobically without oxygen. And they create sewer gases which are also toxic to plants. So here you got a plant and this grower, you know, at least this grower has real dirt in here too. I mean, that's what we're down to now is that we've kind of given up on the growers who use straight compost because, you know, uh, we know the plants are going to die within three years. Certain, well, we'll go over that in a second. But some of my growers still mix dirt and soil together. And this is one of them, so we use them because they're the least bad out there. Uh, half the stuff you see in a nursery is stuff that we've grown because we just can't stand selling plants and we know they're going to die. So on the table behind me, we've got plants whose oxygen levels, you know, plants have different tolerances for how much oxygen they need. So it turns out in the research that conifers, like cedars, pines, junipers, can get by with about 3% oxygen in the ground, or in the water, 3% uh, oxygen in the water in the ground. Roses can get by with little. Apple trees, pear trees get by with very little. Palm trees, interestingly, bird of paradise. One of the best plants I've seen can live in sewage, just about. Uh, impatience is good too, that's why impatience used to be our number one bedding plant, because they can live in the worst soil conditions and make it. Grasses, so your lawn grass can live in black soil, black sludgy soil, ornamental grasses in general can. Lilies, so this is the day lily, we don't see those dying, so I'll buy this mini grower because they can't kill them. So they're so won't kill it. Um, a lot of the plants that you see out there, this type of fits for them, no problem. Uh, guava's no problem. Most daisies, no problem. Pomegranate trees, no problem with the low oxygen levels. The ones that need a lot of oxygen would be on this side. So the worst plant we've seen is English lavender. You look at it wrong and it just rots on you. I mean, we, we grew some English lavender once. We got liners, which are plants in pots about two inches in size, but they were grown and the liners had bark in them. And we grew four different kinds of lavenders. Our other lavenders were fine, 100% take. English lavenders, about 70% of them died because of one inch, well, one, uh, it was about an inch and a half of bark right around the crown of the original root system was just rotting them out. They just pick them up, they just fall out of the ground. They're rotting right at that stem where it went into the dirt. So lavender is really sensitive to that. But one of the interesting things along the way that we saw, we used to buy these elephant here. This is Amazon, uh, African mask elephant here from a grower, and they would just rot on us. And I told the guy, the sales rep, you know, this is a bog plant. It's not supposed to rot. And we, so we watered every day, and things just rotted out in the weeds. So it's just the soil they're using. This is rotting. It's not the water. It's just supposed to live on the water. So we do have, we see that a lot. Uh, strawberries need really good drainage. So the farmers who grow strawberries have to do a lot of, you know, have to have real good soil to grow strawberries. Um, ferns, papayas, we have the flax or formiums. These are notably rotting in everybody's yard. Um, kangaroo paws, same thing. I mean, when my dad grew these in the 1960s and 70s, we couldn't kill them. We just could not kill them. Nowadays, they just kind of rot and fall over because the growers don't use the right dirt on them. <coughs> With the flax, flax used to be the worst weed around, you pull one in and get eight by eight 
couldn't kill the thing. And now they, they all rot on us. Silver sheep pit forms are noted to rot easy. Gardenias. We grow our gardenias from scratch because we found that in the right soil, they're about the easiest plant we've ever grown, except they need a lot of water, but they're about the easiest plant we've ever grown. But we cannot find a grower who can grow a gardenia that won't turn yellow and die within a year. Just cannot. And even though it's possible to fix most plants, gardenias, uh, the success rate on pulling around with their roots to get that wood off of them has been quite low, maybe 30, 40% loss. So we just gave up uh, trying to fix them. We just grow them ourselves. I mean, you take the clipping off the end of a branch stick it in our potting soil, and you put a little plastic bag over, it's like 100% take. It's like, <laughs> really easy. Petunias, you see a lot of these people plant them, and the next couple days later, they said, well, something just ate it off right at the ground, it just fell out. Crown rot, really easy, and petunias in the soil is not done right. Blueberries. A lot of blueberries, if we don't grow them, they usually die within a couple of years. And plumerias, you know, plumeria, it's like most plumeria growers tell their customers, oh, you can only water this like once a week. We water herbs every day. They, they love water. It's like, what plant doesn't like water? I mean, uh, they're warning us that overwatering is the death of all plants. Well, in nature, who watches that? And most plants grow in areas where there's, you know, 50, 80 inches of rain a year, it can rain for a week. No one's watching the water. Why should our plants die from too much water? And why do plants hate water? I mean, that's what we're being told as plants. You know, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. They're making up all these rules on us over the years. Like, don't put a little plant in a big pot because you'll kill it. Well, it's not because the pot is too big. It's just you got too much of that deadly potting soil around it. So anyway, the... Uh, Plumerians, you know, water them every day. Um, here's uh, just one example of stuff we grow versus stuff you buy in. So this is a passion, edible passion vine that we've grown in our own soil. This is what we get from our growers. So that's the color change you'll see in them when the roots can't breed well. Uh, generally you get yellow or just off-colored leaves. Another one would be a succulent, like, here's a succulent that we've grown in our own potting soil and stuff we buy from our growers. I've been to succulent nurseries where every succulent looked like this. This is weird color. But when you grow them in good soil, they come out with a nice clean color. Um, but there are nurseries you just don't see Just don't, well, they haven't been around long enough. So let's talk a little bit first about how soil does what plants need it to do. So there's two terms to know about soil. Important term. Porosity. That's the ability to hold water. <coughs> and permeability. Holding or allowing the air to flow. So soil in general, um, well, what the soil plants would like to live in is called loam. Now we see, you know, we see the term porosity misused because everyone says, well, uh, clay pots are porous, so you, they breathe better. Well, no, clay pots are porous, so they absorb water better. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not breathing. It's it's holding water and permeability is holding air. Loam, and we've seen this written up a lot. Rich loam add a lot of compost to your soil to make it a rich loam. That's not what loam is at all. Loam just means the soil has the three components of natural dirt, which is sand, silt, and clay. And the old, the original 
term for rich loan was sold to have more play. So the way sold works, <coughs> you all know what sand is. It's just say sand is fairly round pieces. Now, loam soils usually have been through a river first. So riverbed, the motion of the water and all that makes the particles. Oh, I should show you one thing first. So if you want to make soil, what you do, what the parent material is, is granite. Now, I'm not sure if this is granite, but it's got black and white specks. So granite generally does have black and white specks in it. So if you take a piece of granite and you grind it up, that's how you get perfect dirt. You don't take a tree and grind it up to make perfect dirt. You take a piece of granite. So the white parts of granite are quartz. Quartz is glass. Glass, also known as silicon dioxide, and that's what sand is. Generally, most sand that we come across is quartz. But, you know, when lightning hits the ground, you get glass because the quartz melts and turns into glass. So, um, so the white parts in the, in the granite are the quartz. The black part, the darker specks, are feldspar, which is quartz combined with minerals like iron if it's red, or brown, uh, aluminum, uh, magnesium for black, uh, and that's what. And then, and but when this thing breaks up and it goes to rivers, <coughs> the sand are the larger round particles of quartz. The silt are the pieces of the sand that are much smaller, so maybe one-tenth, one-twentieth the size of sand. And clay is the feldspar, the dark areas here, that actually break off in flakes, real fine, like cornflakes or confetti. The clay particles are really tiny. You can't see an individual clay particle. In water, you know, it's murky, but they're too small to see. So. When you combine these three, you have loam, and this is how it works. Now, if this was to scale, the sand wouldn't be tennis balls, they'd be uh, bowling balls, or even bigger. And then the silts are these ping pong balls, and I have lentil seeds in here to represent the clay, so flat particles. Um, sand and silt are relatively round, and relatively round objects the volume of the, if you, have a, you know, if you have a container full of sand, the solid sand makes up about two-thirds of the volume of this container. One-third is the airspace between them. So sand breathes really well. It's one-third air. Air goes right through it. Uh, silt, same thing, but it's much smaller. Now, air does have trouble going through smaller holes, even though there's this many holes in silt as there is in sand, it's smaller and it's a little harder to breathe. So sand gives you the best airflow, still not so good. Clay, actually clay has the most air of all because it's the smallest particle. So they say if you had pure, you know, perfectly dry clay in a container, it would be 40% air space. But the spaces are so tiny the air can't get through. They're just blocked because there's too many twists and turns and the space are too small. So even though clay is almost all, you know, it's almost half air, the air can't get through very well. This is like a container full of flour. The air can't get through very well because the particles are too tiny. So clay doesn't, clay soils have low permeability but extremely high porosity. Now the reason why they're porous, I can draw this in a different color, is that you look through a microscope at soil from your garden, you'll notice that every piece of sand that you dig out, not on the surface but underneath, has a shiny layer on the edge of on the surface of it. That's because water you know, clay, uh, soil particles, all the soil particles have a negative charge. Water is ionic, it's got a positive negative charge, so the uh, positive part of the water, which is the hydrogen molecules on the side of it, stick to the soil really strongly. 
So you get this one layer molecule of water on each particle of soil that's stuck really strong. It's hard to get it off unless you bake it off. And around silt, you get that same layer, same one molecule thick. And on the clay, you get that same layer too. The clay being such a small molecule, it's a clay can only be as thin as 28 molecules thick. It's got a one molecule thick layer of water stuck on it, so it really holds a lot of water for how much volume it takes up in the ground. Sand, a lot less. Sand, maybe you know, a couple thousand or even a million molecules thick. It's still only holding one molecule thick of water on it. So if you had a one foot high uh, column of pure sand, it'll take about a little less than an inch of water to coat all the sand particles. So that's how much water a foot of sand can hold is a little bit less than one inch in general. If you had one inch of uh, one foot of clay, it would take close to two inches of water to wet the entire amount of clay to coat all the particles of clay. So clay holds more than twice as much water as sand does. So back in the 1800s, before we had irrigation, the farmers wanted a clay soil. They didn't want sand because that soil was too dry. It was so in the old days, and, and clay, with all it's holding its water, the nutrients that water holds get stuck on it too. So clay is also considered more nutrient rich than sand because there's more place for the nutrients to stick in there. So the dry sandy soils were considered the poor soils. The nice black clay soils were considered a darker clay soil is considered the rich soils. Now we know, you know, with, with the soil that we're using for, you know, with the plants coming in compost now, compost and clay is a bad combination. Because the one thing clay doesn't do well, it doesn't breathe. And if you have something that's using up all the oxygen you're in, in around the plant's roots and you stick it in clay, that thing just rots immediately. So that's one of the problems we're having. If you live on the foothills here, so in Orange County, uh, the best soil is between the five freeway and the foothills. This is the soil. It's, it's sandy loam. So sandy loam, which is the term, is roughly 60% sand, say 30% um, silt, and 10% clay. And those numbers can be up and down about 10% and still be sandy loam. I mean, the geologists know for, you know, they can look at a piece of soil, analyze it, tell you exactly where an orange county comes from. They're that good. They know the soils that well, where each type of soil is, where the clay soils are. So the hills are sandy clay, which means they have a lot of sand in them. But what happens? So in sand and silt soils, if you had 100% sand or silt, you'd have a lot of air space in them. But because these are one third air space, if your clay content reaches one third, about 35% clay, then all the space between the sand and the silt are filled with clay, no more air movement. And that's when you get clay soil. So our soils in Orange County, the hills are generally sandy clay. They get just a little too much clay to breathe. Now, there are some areas of the hills that are sandy, too. But a lot of the typical hills in Orange County, sandy clay, the, water, the rainwater brings that down off the hills. The sand being heavier than the clay tends to settle out first. So right below the hills here, we've got some good sandy soil. Lots of sand, a little bit of clay. As the rivers go out to the ocean, slow down, the clay finally settles out. So you go to, like, Fountain Valley, you get some really gumbo clay out there because the clay you know, finally settles down closer to the ocean as the rivers slow down. So there's so as we get go toward the ocean, the soils become more clay-like, really bad clay too. Of course, you can always be right next to a riverbed. Along the sand and rivers, there's a lot of sand. That river runs so fast that it deposits a lot of sand right along the river banks. But in between there, you get a lot of clay. So usually, 
five freeway this way, good sandy soil, and you head toward the four or five, you get into the clay. Pass the four or five, you're in good clay there. So you have to watch how you treat your soil. Um, one way to analyze your soil, get a mayonnaise jar, fill it dirt about two thirds the way, or half to two thirds. Add water to the neck, a few drops of soap, shake it up really good, get all those particles of soil uh, floating in the water good. Sometimes you've got to do this several times because there's clods in there and you have to break them up. Uh, then just set the jar down, and because sand is, is a bigger particle, it's heavier in the water, it settles first. And then the silt, and the water will be murky overnight. If I swirl this up a little bit, you can see what it looks like gravy coming off the top of that soil, that's your clay layer. It'll settle down overnight, and sometimes you have to do a shake it a couple days in a row to get all the particles apart, and then they'll settle down in the right order. Uh, this is this soil in the water, something like 5-8% clay in the soil. This is very, very sandy soil. The farmer we were next to said so this is the best soil he's farmed on in Orange County. And it's funny because the farmers don't get it either. A uh, strawberry farmer says they have the best land near the Santa Ana River. He says, it's the richest soil. I can grow the best strawberries. Well, it's just sand. <laughs> but strawberries need that good air circulation. So in pure sand, they grow really, really well. Yeah, it's sometimes hard to make up, but the sand particles are bigger. I mean, this is sand all up to about here. The silt is really hard to make up because it's smaller sand, but it's easy to see the clay because you can't see the particles. It's just a clean gray layer at the top, a pure smooth gray layer. So between the sand and the, and the clay is the silt. And, and it does happen the clay kind of migrates down through the sand and silt. So. It's not perfect, but it gives you a rough idea because we take some of the hilly areas near the coast here and put them in the same thing. You'll see a thick layer of clay at the top. And you know, it's just way, you know, 50% clay. It's really heavy clay. Mm -hmm. So what we know about soil is that so if the clay exceeds about 33%, it, the soil no longer breathes. But we've been also told by the agricultural people that there's no soil in Orange County that's more than 60% clay. So they said that any soil, if you add, if you um, make it half sand by volume, it breathes. So it's, you know, you hear these people tell you that sand and clay, you get concrete. They don't know what they're talking about because all, all soils have sand, silt, and clay in them. It increases sand. It increase the clay, it holds more moisture, but it doesn't breathe anymore. So you can adjust the numbers just by adding things to it. Now, no one sells clay. <laughs> they, sell, they sell sandy loam. Sandy loam is also known as fill dirt. So in the construction site, if you're going to fill a hole, they're not going to use clay fill because when, you get, when the clay gets wet, it expands. When it shrinks, it dries. It doesn't work too well to fill things with, with clay soil. So sandy loam is often called fill dirt, or fill sand. Uh, essentially, it's just dirty sand. It's got a little bit of clay in it, but not enough to make it so it doesn't breathe. But this is perfect soil, and, and if you want to buy it from a building supply yard, it's dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. The problem is they don't want to sell you this. If you tell them you're going to go plant it, they'll force you to buy their topsoil, or they take this stuff and mix it with compost. They think that's better for the plants. Um, so in nature, they went around the country 20, 50 years ago, just analyzing how much organic matter is in the soil. The average that they determined back then, 0.9% by volume, so less than 1% are organic matter in soil. The well, University of New Hampshire almost been three years now, put out an article saying it's zero percent. They said what they were what they were doing was they were killing organisms as they collected the dirt samples and counted the dead things they just killed as dead organic matter in the ground 
And when they do a real careful study of the soil, they can't find any dead stuff in it. So the soil should be just 100% mineral. Now this is on a farm. Now farms in general, a once a year, because they know that this is important to the plants, so having dead stuff around. So what they do is they spread out five cubic yards of compost per acre of a farm, spread it out evenly and till it in. That's what you see here. You don't see it, but it's there. But it's, you know, that's it's, what's about 1%. So the University of California Davis in the year 2000 went around the farms and they wanted to recheck the farms to see if the farmers were doing things right. Because they said in 1950, when they checked the organic content of the soil, it was 0.9%, just like it was in nature. They want to make sure the farms are not abusing their soil. So in 2001, or 2000, they found it was 1.1%. They said the farmers are doing a good job while they're adding that five yards of compost per, per acre per year and telling it in. That's what it looks like. You don't see it, but it's about 1% organic. Uh, and they said that's perfect for the farm. As far as they're concerned, that's perfect soil for a farm. So this is what you should shoot for, is pretty much just mineral soil. Um, so now in nature, what we also know is even though the soil is pretty much 100% mineral below, there's dead stuff on top. Now it's interesting that the dead stuff on top is called the duff layer. I gotta believe that stuff just comes from dead stuff. <laughs> I can't figure out other, any other way to say it, but five inches thick is the average across the United States. Five inches of dead leaves, dead stuff, laying on top of the ground. And the University of California Davis said that that's where the plants get their new minerals from. They don't live in it, but that's where their minerals are coming from. They, they did a study of the soil, they did a survey of the soils around the Central Valley of California, wanting to see how the soil, type of soil affected the plant growth. You know, some soil is sand, some clay, some high in phosphorus, some high in boron, nothing's high in nitrogen. Uh, they want to see how effective the plant life, they said, no effect. The same plants grew over the entire valley. What had to happen, wherever the leaves piled up, the plant, the same plants grew. They're living off the leaves. The plant, at least the plants are surveyed. Now there are some what are called pioneer plants in nature that actually grab nutrients from the soil. And those are generally what we call weeds. So you clear off the field, the weeds grow. They're the pioneer plants. They have roots that are incredibly <coughs> efficient. They can gather the minerals that they can find in that soil. You know, they're usually their grasses, like foxtail, mustard, weed. Um, they will turn the minerals they get into the soil into their leaves. And when they die, after a few years of that, the bigger, the bigger plants, trees and shrubs, will then start feeding off their dead leaves and then they don't live there anymore. The weeds disappear, you just have the trees and the shrubs living off the dead stuff on the ground. So that's how nature works. Uh, in Climax Forest, well, in a forest, anywhere you go, really. They say in a forest, Climax Forest, you go in there, that's a forest that's been around for a while, analyze the soil, there's absolutely no nutrition in it because everything's in the trees and the leaves. They've taken everything out of the ground. You go to rainforest, they said, the soil is so sterile, there's nothing in it. Yeah, it's, it's all up there. Leaf falls on the ground. So in nature, there is a fungus. And they just figured this out 40 years ago, maybe a little more than 40 years ago. Mycorrhizal Mycor fungus. So here we've been making compost piles. And which, you know, you put, you get the dead stuff, you grind it up, put it in a pile, and that's bacterial degradation. Well, in nature, that's a small part of the way the stuff is recycled. 
nature, they said 90% of it or more is recycled by this fungus. And these mycorrhizal fungus, which they can only discover back in the 70s, because it's, they couldn't tell what was the root of the plant and what was the fungus. So the mycorrhizal fungus looks like root hairs coming off of trees or off of all the plants in the ground. This mycorrhizal fungus looks like the hairs of the roots. And they didn't know that it was not the plant's roots, it was actually the fungus. So what they discovered is that what they thought were the tree's roots, 80% of what they thought were the tree's roots were actually the fungus attached to the tree's roots. They thought all these little hairs coming off the roots were the tree's root. It's actually the fungus. This fungus goes up into the dead stuff, breaks it all down, and feeds it directly back into the roots of the tree. And that's how this operates. The fungus is a, is a symbiotic partner to the trees and 90% and and of the world's plants. And what they get from the plant's roots, the plants make sugar in their leaves, the sugar is transported down the roots, the, the roots give it to the fungus, That's, the fungus makes its body out of cellulose, which is sugar. So the fungus gets sugar from the plant's roots. In exchange, the plants get minerals that the fungus is breaking down and getting when it breaks down the dead leaves. And they said that uh, partnership has been happening since plants first came on the land ever, what is it now, a billion years ago? <laughs> I don't know <laughs> when plants came on land, but they said that the plants migrating from the sea to land couldn't eat the rocks. The fungus was doing that. So they partnered up with this fungus to eat the rocks and give the nutrients back to them. So this fungus can eat mineral rocks too, but it does grow really good job on the leaves. So they found out that the, the minerals in a leaf that falls off the tree can get back in that same tree in as little as 90 days. Faster than it does when it's composted. Composted stuff may take two years to get back to the plant. Mycorrhizal fungus does it much faster. So if you just stick dead leaves in the ground, they can disappear you know, in months. They can be totally gone from this fungus and the tree gets the nutrients right back. So the plants want all their dead leaves underneath them. That's why they drop them there. <laughs> they want this stuff to get recycled right back up. If you don't recycle it, you gotta fertilize. We'll talk about that next week too. So anyway, that's, now the mycorrhizal also helps structure the soil around the plants. So this clay soil, if you've got a clay soil that doesn't breathe well, well the mycorrhizal fungus is like a structure in the ground, it's like they said it's like steel girders in a building. It's got all these structures. It's a very stable system. And then we, there's a lot of microscopic and macroscopic worms. Worms you can see, worms you don't see. They're punching holes through all this stuff going through there. It's like windows in this structure. So they said if a tree's been around, it's got a good mycorrhizal fungus, there's worms in this layer of, of uh, compost. Now, Earthworms are native to California or to Orange well, the United States, really. We have the smaller uh, nematodes and other worms. Earthworms are actually native to Europe. So they said, you know, if you have a choice, don't add them to your garden because they're not supposed to be here. But anyway, the other worms and other bugs, you know, amoebas, protozoas, we have punch holes through this. They said the soil becomes like Swiss cheese. Even if it's clay, it becomes like Swiss cheese if this stuff is in operation. So that's how nature uh, creates better soil. Also. What does happen, so a plant stem is cellulose molecules, which are just a sugar that we can't eat. Cellulose is paper cellulose. Wood is cellulose. It's, the strands of cellulose are glued together in a plant by something called lignin. So lignin is plant glue. It glues the plant together. As the fungi and the, and the bacteria break down the cellulose, strands. The lignin, nothing eats lignin, but it's really sticky stuff. So it goes into the soil below the dead stuff, and it takes all these clay particles, and even bigger particles, and glues them to bigger pieces. So it takes all what is real fine clay and glues them together to bigger chunks that act like sand. So even the clay itself, the properties are changed when the lignin's in there. So the this clay soil becomes less slimy, less sticky, becomes more breathable. So when things are decomposing on the surface, they improve the soil below it. 
Now we used to sell, and I don't have them on the shelves here, but there's a product that has lignin in it. And we've sprayed that on the ground. And you'll notice that after you spray it on a clay soil, it pills up into little beads. It actually glues the little particles together. So it, it, it can improve your soil really quickly by just, they call it aggregation or granulation of the soil. It takes a real slimy soil that doesn't breathe and granulates it so that air can get through easier. So two ways that soils improve the mycorrhizal fungus, the worms, well, three ways, and the soil granulation of the soil. And that's how nature improves soil. Now there's other ways you can do it. You can add more sand to it. So if you've got a clay soil um, and you know, add sand, of course, that, the problem with adding a lot of sand to it, if you make it 50% sand, if you want to make two foot of good soil, you have to add one foot of sand, you're raising your property a foot higher. So it, it, it may not work out too well, or you can scrape off a foot, add a, add a foot of sand, and then mix it in two foot deep. You've got two foot of good soil, which is deep enough for most plants. Again, plants don't work with very deep soil. Now, um, they have found roots of plants 25 foot down near the bottoms of river gorges because it's all rock. So wherever they can breathe, they can live. A friend of mine who's a geologist says that they find plant roots 200 feet down in, in earthquake uh, fault zones. So when the rocks fracture and the air can get through, the roots can go. They can breathe down there. And you've been in Hawaii, been in the lava tubes, roots are hanging through the ceiling because that's this very porous rock. Material. The roots can breathe in that. So they'll live real deep in that kind of soil. But in general soil, even in good soil like this, if you find a root deeper than, say, 18 inches, it's very unusual to find that. That's why you see pictures of trees falling over. You know, the soil this deep comes up. Roots aren't anchored that far down. Just leave it on top. Oh, just leave it on top. Leave it on top. So, okay. yeah, a lot of the literature tells you add a lot of compost, make your soil rich and black. What you're doing is you're creating sewer gases in the ground. You're, you're making it mm -hmm. totally uninhabitable okay. by doing this. Okay. And we've seen that where people, well, I had a person back in the day when they had super soil. She bought 120 bags of super soil, loaded the planter with it. Nothing would grow in there at all. Said, well, it's nice and black. See how black it is? Mm -hmm. Nothing would live in that stuff. It was just pure compost and pure sewer gases, too. Would that be decomposed granite at a, at a lumber yard? Decomposed granite? Well, decomposed granite essentially is sandy loam that hasn't been through the river yet. Mm -hmm. So these particles are all rounded. These particles are all square. The rocks, when they first come off the hillside, are kind of squarish. So that's decomposed granite. So it's similar to sandy loam. It's got a little bit of clay in there. What can you do to process it now? Well, this is good soil. Okay. You've got decomposed granite. That, plants love to live in that. They breathe really well in that. And the, the riverbed hasn't washed out all the nutrients also. I put my fake breath on it. Yeah. And so the baseball diamonds, if you want to grow things in it, uh, things grow really well on that stuff. So, <laughs> so how would you, if I have my yard and I've amended it with this now horrible stuff. How do you I spent that? 10 years throwing it away. So just so, so you know because I didn't know this stuff, you know I should have known it, but I was always taught that you add organic matter to the soil to make it better. So in 1992 I bought my last house and I had all these raised beds to fill up. So I called up the soil company and said what's your best soil to fill all these raised planters? They said it was top soil C. 40% compost, well, a mixture of 40% organic matter, which is compost and manure. So I loaded up all my beds with that, planted my plants, and a year later, half of them died. And we're going, okay, it didn't happen in my first house I lived at. What did I do wrong? And it took us a few years to figure it out. The compost, it's not supposed to be there. I talked to a soil scientist. He was 
sending uh, plotting tools into the space shuttle. And he said, if nothing you guys makes works at all, what's wrong with your industry? And I was frustrated at that time, too, in the late 80s, early 90s, because, yeah, we were putting citrus in pots and the plotting tool, and they wouldn't grow. They would grow like one leaf the whole year, or an inch. Wouldn't do anything. Uh, put a fern in this stuff, just kill it. In two weeks, be dead. We were really frustrated with growing pots. We thought, boy, nothing grows in pots well. I, I, you know, people would ask us to pot stuff up. We would cringe and go, this is going to kill the plant. But uh, so I, I listened to him. He says, yeah, um, they were sending spun glass into outer space. Uh, they were going to use a very heavy pumice, but they found that it floated around the space capsule too much. <laughs> so they just spun it together and made glass out of it, similar to this rock wool, spun glass in outer space and grew the plants in that. They said, you know, uh, your industry is all screwy, you know, and, and worse words than that. I mean, he didn't like to hold back. Uh, and he, said he couldn't believe that we were selling the stuff we were selling because none of it worked at all, he told me. And when we looked at it, when we started doing the research, the first thing we did was plant stuff in pure sand. So the first plant I planted was a strawberry plant, pure sand. So we had two pots that were about 15 inches. One pot was uh, Whitney Farms, Uncle Malcolm's potting soil, which at that time was considered top of the line, you know, real nutritious. That pot was just pure sand. Well, the Uncle Malcolm's potting soil grew a strawberry plant about eight, inch, eight inches across with leaves about this big. The pure sand, and we did fertilize both of them. The leaflets on the strawberries were this big, and the plants were two foot wide. We're going, okay, that Uncle Malcolm's potting soil, that's pure poison. And we couldn't believe it. We tried all different potting soils, same results, eight inch <laughs> wide versus two foot wide strawberry plant. And I'd always wondered why they space strawberry plants in the fields 18 inches apart. I said, they only grow eight inches wide. Why are they spacing them 18 inches apart? Well, that's why, because they grow two foot wide in real dirt. So we started growing everything in sand. We got these absolutely spotless plants, no yellow leaves ever. You know, just spotless plants. Couldn't believe how bad potting soil was. But we knew we couldn't sell sand as potting soil because no one could hold the bag. You know, um, if a bag of sand was this big, it'd be 100 pounds. So we had to figure out a way to do that. Now you have a question. Uh, yeah, uh, regarding worm castings, do you recommend mixing it in the mix or just top layer? We have it on top. The nature worm poop is on top of the ground. That's where it belongs. Yeah, you need anything that's organic like that. It's using up a lot of oxygen to decompose further. And so you want to leave it on top where there's more oxygen. So if you bury anything organic, it causes... Now, the soil scientist pointed out to me, because he said in their own testing, any speck of organic matter that was in that soil mix, the brown roots around would turn brown. Because they couldn't breathe. They would just turn brown. So, you don't want to manicure your yard, guys. You want, no, you can put as much organic matter on top of the ground, you know, even 18 inches deep. I mean, you go to uh, some forest, it's like this deep of dead leaves. It all belongs on top. It's as long as you don't bury it. Burying it underneath the dirt is when the air can't get to it. That's when you have trouble. Now, if the organic matter is too fine, and then the air might not get through it. Grass clippings are notably, you don't want to put them on too thick because they don't breathe too well. But if it's coarse leaves, branches, all that stuff, you can put on it really deep. I thought with cover crops, you're supposed to let them die and turn brown and then till them in? Well, farmers have to till things in because, if, you know, on a farm there's no windbreaks. So if they don't till things in, it just blows away. So that's the reason why they turn in compost when they turn it in, even though, you know, I've talked to them, they said, we have to till it in. Because if we don't till it in, it's gone. It just blows away. So they have no choice there at your home. Yeah, you, know, you just leave the, uh, the alfalfa and the legumes on top of the ground. They'll do their thing on top of the ground. Okay. So I guess thinking about it, so if I dig out, now that I've now put all this horrible stuff in, so if I want to dig that out, what do I put in this place? Let's go by sandy loam. Yeah, sandy loam, decomposed granite. Sand is fine. I mean, things love sand. Okay. Um, Sand is more expensive, so sandy loam and decomposed granite are both dirt cheap. 
there was dug out of the ground uh, anywhere in certain locations and they sell it to you. It's really inexpensive. I don't know what it is nowadays. Now it's buying this back in the 90s. It was about 15 to $18 a scoop, which is enough to fill back with a pickup truck. A scoop is supposed to be half a cubic yard, 13 and a half cubic feet. It turns out to be more like 18 because they, you know, that, that's, that loader is a little bit overfilled. It's not flat filled. So you get quite a bit. You get, that's what makes it about, what, about a dollar per cubic foot? Per cubic, yeah, per cubic. Boy, that's per cubic yard, about a dollar per cubic yard. That's pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. You just get like support with the building. Oh, yeah. Per yeah. cubic foot. Per cubic foot. Yeah, half a yard. It's 18 cubic feet. Yeah. Uh, one yard is uh, 27 cubic feet. Three by three by three. And a pickup truck won't hold it. Full yard unless it's a, uh, like a 200 model or it's a thousand model. <laughs> a bigger has to have a bigger, bigger payload. The scoop weighs over a thousand pounds. Uh, dirt's about 110, 130 pounds per cubic foot. So always fun. Why do we go to analyze the soil? Because if we already have, you know. The right soil, then we don't have to be yeah. anything. Yeah, you don't have to buy it. Well, the soil is not supposed to be a source of nutrition anyway, so right. you know, they analyze soil, it's like, why? There's nothing in it, there's not supposed to be anything in it. Yeah. The plants don't live off the soil, so, uh, so you don't have to analyze the soil. The pH doesn't matter if you're using organic fertilizers, just if you're using chemical ones, so you don't really have to get your soil analyzed. Okay. I mean, you, you know, if you think there's a poison in there, then you might, you know what the poison is. How about your dog's pee? Because my dog's pee everywhere, <laughs> so every yeah, time I want to plant salt. something, it's like... It's a lot of salt, <laughs> so you might, you know, you need a couple of good, really wet winters to wash the salt out, or yeah. a lot of irrigation. Yeah. That, that's a tough one. Um, okay, so if you plant a plant and everything's perfect, you just dig a hole drop it in. If you got one of our plants that we grew, which is perfect, you just make a whole bean up to put in there and that's it. You just put it in, make sure it gets enough water. And what do I mean by that? This time of year, it's very important to water your plants when you plant them. And the problem we have is, is that soil generally has a much more stronger pull on water than the soil in these pots. Here's the reason why. So, in a container, so the ground is like a series of sponges. The water keeps transferring from the top sponge to the next sponge, next one, next one. In a container, especially this plastic one, there's no sponge pulling the water out the bottom. So, like this, like the sponge, there's a water table in here. So, the last bit of soil in that pot is stuck with water. And on certain plants, it may stay there too long and may rot the plant out, especially if there's compost in that soil. So it turns out that the finer the soil texture, the higher the water table. If this was clay, the water table would be up here. It would be saturated all the way to the top. Um, this sandy loam might be saturated about here. Coarse of soil like sand may be saturated to only about here. Uh, so they have to make the soil in pots coarser to uh, drain better, let's put it that way. So when you put a plant in, the, in a hole in the ground, the soil here is coarser than the soil around it. So if you water here, the water is sucked out into the soil around it. So if you water out here, the water never goes to that root ball. So if you just put a plant in the ground and you turn the sprinklers on, the ground here may be fine and wet. All the water here is getting sucked into the soil around it. You really have to make sure the water goes straight through that root ball. So you have to make this basin, catch basin around that root ball this time of year and make sure the water goes right through it before the ground sucks it dry. <laughs> and you pretty much have to water it every day or even twice a day. I mean, when my dad used to do landscaping, he would make sure the sprinklers were on three times a day for five minutes each so that even if you didn't have the catch basins, they would stay wet until they got established. When a plant gets established, that means enough root is out to the native soil. It only takes a few weeks so that 
this can be dry, and as long as this is wet, the roots can get the water. But it usually takes at least a few weeks for that to happen. If it's a box tree, it may take a whole month to get enough root out to native soil. If it's a bedding plant, you know, the root ball this an inch across, maybe in a day, enough root comes out of here that it's established. So the bigger the plant, the longer you've got to make sure the water gets into it. So that's the establishment period. Now, if you've got a plant, and this is growing a lot of compost, you put that in the soil, and if you have clay soil around it, or heavy soil around it, these roots can rot because there's not enough air to get this. You know, these the pots have air holes at the bottom, which helps prevent that rotting in there also. So, you put them in the ground, there's no more air holes down there, so you gotta make sure the soil out here is well aerated. You can either, now I had one landscaper friend, he just surrounds each plant plants with pure sand. He says, it works. Pure sand around each plant. The pumice. Yeah, you can mix, now if you have clay soil, if you mix it with pumice rock, pumice is nature's area soil. Uh, by volume, pumice is 70% air, 30% rock. So you add this to your clayish soil, it'll breathe. Uh, you can only, you only have to add about 20% pumice to pure clay and it will breathe. Now, most of our landscapers don't like, you know, they don't like to take bags of pumice to cut themselves. They'll think they're crazy, they're putting bags of rocks in the ground. So they buy our acid mix instead, which uh, looks like this. It's half pumice and half peat moss. And there's enough pumice in here that they mix it half and half with their clay soil, it'll breathe. And the peat moss is highly acidic, which helps our alkaline soil also. So peat moss, where we fill a sign, it's been sitting at the bottom of the lake for thousands and thousands of years. It doesn't decompose very much at all. It's still decomposed, but it's so slow, it doesn't seem to rob the soil of oxygen. So we feel that's fine. You can mix that in the soil as much as you want. You're not gonna ruin the roots for lack of air. So that mixture is good with the soil around it. So you aerate the soil to help the roots of this plant breathe better. The roots of this plant will grow out to this airy zone, hit the heavier soil, and then live in the zone where they can breathe, which is usually closer to the surface of this clay. But you gotta give them this opportunity to get out there, stay alive, and then get to the native soil. Cover the soil with mulch after you're done. So that they can live near the surface where there's more <coughs> air. If you don't cover with mulch after you're done and it's hot, they can't live near the surface, it's too hot. Uh, but they can't live down deep either because they can't breathe, so there's no place to go. So if you cover clay soil with mulch, suddenly becomes really good soil. The plant says suddenly this over, you know, in a few days, they look a lot, lot better if the ground's covered with the mulch. Or something, it could be gravel, it could be rocks, anything to keep that ground insulated. So. What do you think of bark? Fine. So it depends what you want. I mean, rocks never go away, but they're not very nutritious. Bark stays for years, a little more, a little more nutritious than rocks. Then you just put compost on the top, and that's highly nutritious, doesn't last more than a few months. So you have your choice if you put all of them on there. So, and the bigger the plant, like 20 years ago, there was a notice by U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they said we're having trouble with box trees. Because box trees have root systems that are 20 inches deep. And they know that's a big problem because roots just suffocate. Roots in nature don't live 20 inches deep. And here, they're selling us plants with roots that are 20 inches deep. So they said, to fix this, put air pipes with holes in them on all sides of this root ball. When somebody gets the problem, U.S. Department of Agriculture, to keep the trees alive, don't put any organic material in the backfill, they said but air pipes around this root ball. So the big problem is, is how the nurseries are growing their plants. 
If you've got a big root ball fill of compost, you'll still lose that plant even with all this help. So back about five years ago, six years ago, there was a lawsuit. Santa Monica, the city of Santa Monica bought trees from Valley Crest, who's no longer around, so I can say their name, <laughs> uh, saying that all the arbutus trees they had bought from them rotted in the landscape. So they're suing the company for the cost of the trees. And we had bought the same trees and seen that they rotted because there's too much organic matter there, so we stopped buying trees from that company. So the lower court said, fine, looks like it was promised trees. The California Supreme Court overturned it. They said, Valley Crest had followed the University of California's protocol on growing plants. They can't be wrong. The tree was perfect when you got it. And that's the state of our industry. The nurseries are growing plants exactly how the colleges are telling them to do it, and they're dying from root rot. And we can't do anything about it because University of California, or whoever, which, which university system it is, can't be wrong. Hmm. So we're not getting anywhere fixing this problem. So all the growers are being taught uh, to grow plants in wood products, uh, and nobody can seem to change their mind about it. Now, when I was a kid, we grew all the nursery plants in this. Never had problems with water. My dad told me when I was a kid, growing plants is real easy. Water them every day, fertilize them once a month. Everything does fine. In the 80s, when they started using all these wood products, now, initially, the wood products they used was redwood compost. And that wasn't bad. So they had about 10 years where they didn't have any problems doing that because redwood is the most resistant wood to rot. Decomposes real slowly. They said redwood rots in seven years. So it just, you know, they were planting things in redwood and sand, and it just wasn't, we weren't having any trouble with those plants. Well, in the late 70s, early 80s, redwood suddenly became scarce. They had cut down all the virgin forests in California, and redwood suddenly became scarce. They switched it over to uh, fir shavings, and that was the early 80s. And things were just rotting left and right. My dad called that confirmed and said, what's wrong with their plants? And they told him, you can't water your plants every day. You'll kill them from overwatering. And that's the first time we heard that term, overwatering. Because up until that time, from the time he had started his business, he had watered everything every day without a problem. And suddenly it became a problem. So he told me in the 80s, you figure this out. I can't figure this out. So we had to make up all these rules on watering plants growing in compost in the, in the fur shavings. Now they finally figured out that fur bark um, rotted a little slower than fur shavings, thereby turned to fur bark. So most nurseries now use fur bark, um, which lasts a little bit longer. Fur shavings, you know, within a year, we're losing half the volume of the soil. Fur bark would usually hold up for close to a year before it started <coughs> dropping off on us. So we had to make up all these rules. Do not water the plant until the soil looks dry on top. Or pick it up and see if it's light. But if you waited a day too long, the plant would start drying up on you. And it was so bad, my dad put me in charge of the citrus. You water that citrus every day, it would turn yellow within the third day. You watered every two days, it would dry up on you. You'd have to hit it right when it was drying up. It was this I thought, God, this is so hard to grow citrus. How can anyone do this? I mean, it turns out that if, you were, if your soil was sandy, like in Santa Ana, Orange, Garden Grove, the compost and the root ball wasn't the problem. If it was that sandy, you can get by with sprinkler irrigation. It didn't matter if you got the root ball wet. It, it breathed really well anyway, so it wasn't a problem. But if you lived in the air with clay soil, yeah, no, you grow citrus. I couldn't believe how bad it was, how, how difficult it was to keep the citrus alive. And we started complaining to companies, everyone thought we were crazy, so I just quit after about 10 years complaining to our growers, I quit because they were all taught different ways. Like, you know, you look up uh, the definition of potting soil, official definition of potting soil, it's organic matter supplemented with other products. They don't even know what dirt is. This is the EPA's definition of potting soil. 
So that if you sell a bag of potting soil, if you don't have organic matter in there, they'll question you. They'll say, this can't be potting soil. There's no organic matter. <laughs> it's really weird. They've been taught that, so they don't think that anything else is true. You talk to any nurseryman, you'd say you grow things in sand, they say, there's no tradition. They can't go plant some that. Yes. Are there like labeling laws by chance of what you can label it as if they if it is not the right content? I'm just curious. I don't know okay. what those laws are. Because like your label and it it says something different. I just I just wondered if that's why your label. Well, we were different. we were uh, told that we couldn't put down that our potting soil was permanent. Okay. They told me I had to prove that sand, volcanic rocks, and sponge rock are permanent materials. Mm -hmm. I had the research to prove that. Mm -hmm. That's from like the EPA. Yeah. Okay. Those guys, you know, I mean, I listen, you know, the main, the one, the biggest, the most numerous degree here happens to be peat moss. Mm -hmm. It's 33% peat moss. So they said, yeah, peat moss is your first degree. It can't be a permanent soil. Well, it's 66% permanent material in here. It's permanent, but you know, we're not going to tell them what the, what the percentages are, so we don't want anyone to know. But uh, uh, so we couldn't put it down that it was a permanent soil because they didn't believe it. So you know, it, it, it's we're hitting roadblocks all the way to try to get something right. Uh, we moved into a house 30 years ago, um, and it was pretty much subsoil because it had been scraped away uh, for the construction. Mm -hmm. And um, it, the, it was very clay. It was like trying to grow something in adobe. So I have systematically been adding compost to it to try to improve the soil. So now, what would you suggest? Do I get a load of the sandy loam and, and try to till that into the soil? Well, if your clay, if your organic content gets too high, then you can't fix it. And when we brought our soil in, we had about eight inches deep of compost and, and sandy loam. We couldn't fix it. It, just, it, it had an odor. Uh, anytime the soil has any odor at all, there's something wrong with it. Like if there's low oxygen levels, the organic matter creates acids, which we're smelling, we're smelling the acids. If it gets really bad, like near a faucet, stuff would turn black on us. That's aerobic, the anaerobic decomposition. We're creating sewer gas there, so we just <coughs> scrape it all off. And took away, it took me 10 years to change the soil back to what it started with. We put in sandy loam. So what we noticed was this soil we had that was 6% sandy loam, 40% organic matter, as we're digging up, we would find a lone root about every about every six inches running through that soil, we would find one root. We'd find more roots at the very top of it. We'd find a lot of roots in the native soil below it. It was crazy. They were, they, they were living below it and on top of it, but not in it. Just one or two, one every six inches. When we changed it to this soil and dug it up three months later, one root every quarter inch through this soil. So that's what uh, six times four, 24 times more root dense roots in this soil than the amended soil. So we didn't save any of the amended soil. If, that, if they can only support that much root, there wasn't any, it wasn't growing plants. Mm -hmm. So we took it all out. Now we left it in where we had our apple trees because the apples didn't seem to care. The apples don't need much oxygen. Uh, so we didn't have any problem with that. Uh, the apples are in that original soil. The lawn lived in it. We just left the lawn as is, although we did um, <coughs> put a new patch of grass in, scrape the dirt up, put in our, our top pot potting soil and the grass there grew twice as fast and a lot greener. <laughs> but we put in the, the better soil. So, I mean, the first house I lived at in the 80s, we, we brought in four inches of compost, tilled it in where we, the grass was, planted the grass, grass would fine. The marathon people told us their grass roots go 10 foot deep, so I wanted to check that. Dug down the soil, the roots on my plants were half an inch long. I'm, I was thinking, they lie. The roots don't grow 10 foot deep, they grow a half an inch. Well, all that compost, they couldn't grow down there. They were living right on the surface, half an inch of root. So, uh, or maybe um, um, garden bed by garden bed, you would just scrape it out and start over with mm -hmm. better soil.
And the hard part is just getting rid of the dead bad stuff. If you have a big hillside nearby, just spread it thinly over it, won't hurt anything. Or if you have a huge lawn, thin layer of dirt over the lawn won't hurt anything. But it's hard to fix soil that's got too much compost in it. If it doesn't smell bad, and if you put it in water and not, and not much floats in there, then you're probably okay. Because it does get eaten up over time, but if you had like 40% like I have, way too much, uh, it would take too long. That, that's all never correct. <coughs> and you know, plants that come in compost, um, the compost, if the plant doesn't die, it eventually comes around. Like I planted a citrus in my garden that had the sawdust that came with the plants in it. It sat there for 10 years not doing anything. And then it took off and grew. And when I was a kid, my parents had planted citrus in their clay soil mission vehicle. And they hadn't fixed their plant. They didn't know anything about that, so they just put them in there. We noticed that the first four or five years, the plants would get smaller and smaller. None of them would die. They'd get smaller and twiggier and twiggier. And then about the fifth year, they would turn around and start to grow. And by the eighth year, they all looked pretty good, and they were bushy and producing fruit. And I thought when I was growing up, citrus take a long time to get established. But in the 80s, one of the first things I noticed is I bought a tree from an orchard supplier, not the retail stuff, an orchard. The guys that planted the orchard, just put the ground in my house, grew two foot, first year had a crop. I'm going, okay, there's something really wrong with retail citrus. And it's just that compost on the roots. Because the stuff I'd gotten from the orchard supplier was in pure sandy loam. Heavy as heck, but it grew mm. like a weed. So say you buy like a plant from a Home Depot or one of those nurseries. How do you go about removing that dirt and put it into your own system? Um, well, that'll be the last thing I show you. So, the history of potting soil. So, potting soil, uh, you know, the people have grown plants in pots along with where the apparently the bonsai people in Japan and China. So, I have my dad's bonsai book and they don't mention anything about ever adding organic matter to the soil. They just mentioned that sand is too vigorous. So they knew that sand grew plants most vigorously. They had figured that out thousands of years ago in pots. Said we can't use sand for bonsai because everything grows too big. So you add uh, something with clay in it, the loam soil, or something even more clayish to it to the sand to, to to make it breathe, you know, make it heavier, and then it makes all the leaves on your plant smaller and makes it grow slower. So that's how one side miniaturizes things. They add enough clay to the sand or to whatever soil that they're using, a sandy loam and add more clay to it to shrink everything down inside. They said, be careful, if things start to rot on you, take it out of the pot, take all the soil off, put it in the pure sand until it recovers. So bonsai people knew what they were doing. Uh, back in the 1800s in Europe, they had the first greenhouses uh, in, I guess they're in Italy, or France. I guess France had the first greenhouses, and they had these huge clay pots with citrus they had brought in from the Orient. And recently they had analyzed the soil in those pots and said 98% sand. The citrus are growing in 90% sand. In fact, in my house right now, I've got a citrus plant in a pot sitting by my front walkway in pure sand for over 20 years now. Uh, doesn't look as good as it did 20 years ago because you're not supposed to have things in any pot that long and go inside and <coughs> redo the soil about a minimum every 10 years, but it's still hanging in there. So it looks a lot better than a lot of people's citrus trees. How often do you have to fertilize it? Well, the first year we had a pure sand, we had to fertilize it every two weeks, then we decided to throw a little compost on the top. And after that, no more problems. It acted just like it was in the ground. A little compost on the top of that soil, once a year fertilizer was enough. So in fact, I don't think I've fed it much in the last few years. It just hangs in there because of, you know, it's got a little organic matter on the top of the ground with the dead leaves and stuff like that. What do you fertilize it with? Well, there's a lot of things you can use. That's next week's lecture. Um, Will the kelp, the sea kelp, work? No. Good sea kelp? That's next week. Sea kelp is, I have so you have to use a lot of it. Um, so we, to make our own potting soil, again, we knew that sand was too heavy to carry, and people wouldn't buy it. They wouldn't 
trust us if we sold back to Sam. So I was talking to some guys at University of Riverside who actually know something, and they said, well, uh, pumice is the lightest form of, of silicon dioxide. So that one's not bad. Perlite's even lighter, but we don't like it because it's, it's too light. It floats. <clears throat> there are some pumice rocks in nature that are very, very light. You can blow them and they float in the air. But the rigor pumice is fine. But we had to make it hold more water, so they told me the the material that natural material that stores water the best has to be peat moss. And peat moss has a five-year life in the soil. So uh, now clay holds water better than peat. But clay will not let half the water go. It just sticks to the clay. So peat moss will give all the water. You know, if you have something in pure peat and it gets dry and it shrinks like crazy. Well, it turns out if you mix peat with something else like pumice, it doesn't shrink anymore, and it doesn't. It's not hard to wet anymore. So we just and plus, I believe our soil company adds a little wetting agent to it, so the water wets real well again. So we just made it. We thought, okay, let's mix equal parts of two opposites: best air supply, best water holding. Come together, got our ass mix. We sell it to the state, and people love it. Everything grows in it like a weed. Uh, the peat moss, because peat moss does decompose and get about a shrink to about 15 percent but for vegetables flowers or just things you know want to put in the ground grow ferns and add blueberries uh, it's, it's hard to beat that it just uh, seems to be the perfect material to grow plants and we start all our seeds and cuttings and that peat moss and pumice are both in sterile and sterile mediums um, so and you know we come across people tell us, well, is that coconut more sustainable? It's like, okay, how many coconut palm trees are there in the world versus how many peat bogs are there in Russia? Um, I think there's a there's a uh, little problem there. There's, you know, they said one peat bog in Canada can supply all the peat moss in the United States forever. Uh, how many coconut trees are there in the world in Sri Lanka and those areas? You know, it's like, What's more sustainable, peat bog or coconuts? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so our acid mix, we grow a lot of stuff in that, and everything does well, but it does shrink a little. So we said, okay, if we're going to grow a tree or a bush in a pot, we don't want that shrinkage. So we wanted to put less peat moss in there, so our top pot, and we also wanted to add more materials, different materials to it. So, because it's, if we make it like, 70% pumice and 30% peat is going to be heavy. Pumice rock is still kind of heavy. So we added uh, perlite, 10% perlite, not too much. I don't like perlite that much, but it does make it lighter. And we added some charcoal to it. Now charcoal is the only totally inert form of organic matter that's reasonably available. So charcoal is not ashes, so if you burn a tree up to the point where it turns white, it's now ash. It's totally uh, gone, it, it'll, that ash decomposes too fast, uh, and it's also highly alkaline. Charcoal is when you have wood that's under real high heat but not enough oxygen to make it turn to ash. So it's charcoal, it's just caramelized wood or whatever you want to call it. Nothing eats charcoal, it still can burn of course, but nothing can eat it. So charcoal in the ground is a firm material, and charcoal is what makes the rich black soils of the world rich and black. Urban, they had a real extremely hot wildfire that wouldn't let the trees burn totally, or uh, volcanic activity where the hot gases come down off the mountain, everything instantly turns to charcoal. So the sides of volcanoes in Italy are real rich soil because they got a lot of dead trees in the ground that are charcoal. So charcoal is what makes the rich black soil is real rich and black, and it's currently it's permanent. Once it happens, it's there forever. They said you went to some of the jungles in Central America, you'll find this one area that's really lush. Dig down there, you'll find remnants of a campfire from 10,000 years ago. They said that area is going to be lush forever. So charcoal is, is the secret ingredient to making great soil. But it's also the most expensive thing you can make soil out <laughs> of. Uh, our suppliers were going to raise the bag on us 
over, they asked them to buy three dollars. They said this stuff is fifty dollars a cubic foot to make. <clears throat> so uh, we've got five percent here. We were thinking about lowering it. Now, in nature, the rich black soils were over only two percent charcoal. It doesn't take much charcoal, apparently, to make the soil look black. This is like when you have toner loose from your office, everything turns black. Um, that's pure carbon. So anyway, uh, we added that and made our potting soil. Now, we have, just so you know, we've seen these articles come out of Holland. So Holland, the government sponsors all the research for agriculture there. Here, the, they leave it to a lot of private enterprise do that, but in Holland it's such an important part of the economy. They grow, you know, flour, cut flowers and vegetables for all of Europe. That's their economy. So they've done a lot of research on pothouse growing, growing mediums for pots and pothouses. And they list all the materials that work and all the materials that don't work. So they do list peat, coconut choir, coconut choir will hold up for about a year's use in a, in a pot. Peat moss, about the same length of time. Rice hulls, and these are things that are easily available to all of the world. Rice hulls have to be 90% silica. They don't need post at all. They said you go up to Sacramento and stand on the levees. Some of the levees were full of rice hulls from the rice fields there. 50 years ago, and you dig it up and it's fresh. They don't need post. Um, that's about it on the organic matter. For containers, they also recommend sand, uh, perlite, pumice rock, rock wool, which is uh, just melts of rock spun into a wool-like material. Of course, the glass fibers, polypropylene fibers, polyethylene fiber, you know, plastic material, uh, foam stuff. The top of line stuff happens to be clay pellets. So here's clay that holds water but it's fired in the beads, so it holds air too. That's like the ultimate soil. It's really into material. The most expensive crops world use the most expensive and the best growing medium. So if you go to a good pot farm, this is what they grow the pot plants in. That's the most expensive crop. This is the best material growing in uh, clay pellets. And they don't, and they said they tried, you know, Europe invented the, the pallet system of moving things, forklifts and pallets. So they have a lot of wood around. They said we tried for years to make ground up wood or ground up bark work as a growing medium, but it won't work. And they said the problem is it's one piece of wood, I don't have a piece of wood here handy, one piece of wood, parts of it decompose three or four times faster than other parts. Wood is not a uniform material, so they can't make it work. But here in the United States, the plants are all grown in this stuff. We know some of our nurseries have told us they got some bark from some source, and all the plants died. It's like, okay, why are they using this stuff? They said they just blame it on a bad batch of bark. Yes? So this seems counterintuitive to like the vegan culture, or however you say it, movement? Or Permaculture? Or, no, the view where you build the hill with the wood under. I guess it's not a wood, it's kind of like the, um, where you, you bury the wood and let it decompose and then you kind of build it up with the saw on either side. Are you familiar with that one? It's no. the H-E-G-E-L culture or whatever. I don't know that. So I, try, I was really interested in setting up some of those, but now I'm like, well, this, that's not like that. But I think it's supposed to help with, with, can, with uh, watering. Well, if, if it's not composted wood. It's not, it's just buried, but I imagine it would not yeah. have to stand. Yeah, but if solid wood breaks down so slowly compared to I chipped see. wood, okay. it's not an issue. Like, tree roots in the ground decompose, mm -hmm. but they don't cause any trouble. The things that are, you know, as long as it's a solid piece like that, it's, it's decomposing relatively slowly because there's not much surface area. Yeah. Okay. You know, if, you, if you break things in little tiny pieces, the surface area is huge, but a uh, solid piece of wood you throw in a pond, it takes years and years and years for that wood to be Does it hold water? I mean, would that concept work where you build up these solid pieces and cover it with 
like inverted sod or something, and then plant it into the. It would hold a little bit of moisture, um, not much. They have to reevaluate the some of the projects that have to go wrong. <laughs> but yeah, there's no problem with using solid pieces like that. Okay. It's it just doesn't break down very fast. Okay. Okay, so they mentioned wooden bark. They worked on it for years, spent $2 million on research, couldn't make them work. And here, all the plants are essentially growing in that material. So, Holland gets it, uh, U.S. doesn't get it. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with our system. Uh, guys with the, I guess it's the guys at the top that have the titles that uh, won't let anyone say anything. So, uh, Anyway, so some organic matter products are fine. I still don't like to see them make up more than, if you want a permanent soil, they'll make it more than one third of the volume. We notice that the volume of our top pot doesn't shrink at all over time. And even though it's 33% or 35% peat moss, uh, we think what's going on is that the rock is making up all this volume. The peat moss is sitting in between the dirt pieces. And as the peat moss Poses, it's not shrinking the volume because the volume of this soil is, is, is sitting on the charcoal, the perlite, the pumice, and the sand to make up this part. The peat moss is just like this stuff that's floating around between the particles. So we think that's what's causing this not to shrink, but it doesn't, it hasn't shrunk on us over time. So, so equivalent to pH then, if it has the same amount of peat moss between the acid mix and that? Well, they're both acidic. Um, this one is somewhere in the five range. Uh, this one is probably somewhere in the six range. But but I was thinking blueberries in a container. Yeah. Well, we've done blueberries with this mix, and they still work. Uh, so you know, it's more what you feed the blueberries than this soil. You know, you feed them sulfate ammonia once in a while, keep them highly acidic. So just do it that way. Uh, this will still work. Okay, so let's show you how to how we change plants over. So even if you you know if you now we don't we find that it's really easy to change the soil on plants that are small. The bigger they are, the harder it is. I've done a few quote 15 gallon trees, but boy, it's so heavy to lift those and take off the soil. It's it's a lot of work. You've got to be really wanting that plant to uh, work on it that hard. Um, let's see. The one plant we do a lot of are bougainvilleas. We find that uh, bougainvilleas, <coughs> if we don't change the soil on them, and they stay around the nursery till winter, what happens in the winter time is the leaves fall off and they stop blooming. We see them in the ground blooming year round. So we're going, okay, there's something wrong with the soil in these pots. So one of the first plants we'd ever changed, this was back in the 90s somewhere, I took a boondia that had just dropped all its leaves and flowers at the end of November. And those were days we actually had winter, so it was actually cold in November. <laughs> and we took all the soil off, put it in our soil, put it back in the pot, fertilized it, and it was bloom and full bloom by Christmas. And it never stopped ever again. It just stayed in bloom year round from that point on. It was just crazy. The difference between what the growers are doing to us and what the plant should do. So, so we spend a lot of our time here in the nursery. Now we don't do everything because some plants, like over on this side, will make it in that composty soil. But we end up changing a lot of plants over to better dirt. And a lot of our customers know how to do this now too. They said, oh, we always do it anyway. And any plant I take home, no matter if it would, if it would survive or not, I do it because they just perform better. So I used to spend a lot of time with an ice pick or a, a thin piece of wood and just carefully try to tease out the soil around the roots until I told my son to do this. <laughs> and it was, it was spending too much time, so he would just do this. <laughs> we're just dropping them on the ground. Oh, yeah, the boat and you're supposed to be very careful with the roots. Right. 
The Bougainvilleas the have such bad root systems because they hate the soil they're growing in so much, there's hardly any root in there. So they say, be very careful. Now, you know, it's funny because this was two years ago, one of my new employees, he had, he had, a lot, he had learned all this stuff, I told him, take these Bougainvilleas out there, plant them by the columns, shake off all the dirt and put them in the ground. He says, they're going to die. I said, no, just watch what happens. <laughs> so this was, we did it in fall, so it was supposed to be cool, but it got warm on us. So after about three days, leaves started dropping off. I said, well, that's a good sign. You know, when plants drop leaves, that's what they're doing. They drop leaves to, to compensate for water. So all the leaves dropped off. And he says, look, they're dead. I said, no, just hold your horses, just wait and see what happens. <laughs> so two more weeks go by, and they start growing back in a, in a herd. And within a month, they were fully leafed out. I mean, they're gorgeous plants now. The leaves are huge, they look fine. Uh, but that's the way we recommend planting bougainvillea from now on, is knock all the soil off the plants. Now, I usually what I do is cut them, cut the tops off. Now, if you, if you want to save the tops, you've got to shade the top of the plant for a while if you want to keep the leaves on it. Uh, so you can just, you know, like what I'll do with this, I'll just throw this in the shade outside for two weeks. Uh, and the, the roots are reestablished in two weeks, and then you can put it back on in the sun. Or I'll stand something next to like a big trash can next to the shade for part of the day, you know, half a day shade. It'll save the leaves on there. Uh, then two weeks later, take away your shade. What I used to do at my house, uh, jump over the wall, take a big branch off of one of the trees in the green belt, use it as a parasol, the leaves will hang on for a few weeks, and use that as a shade. And then, and then uh, the plants will be fine after that. So we just do this on a flat surface. You know, usually the big roots hang in there pretty nicely. Try to support things like this that might break off. Just kind of do that. Uh, you can keep a stick around. Uh, one of our customers gave me this little little stick, especially made. I don't know if it's especially made for this purpose, but you can just punch it through there. Loosen up a little more. Now, the funny thing is, the center of this, where they start the root system, peat and perlite. <laughs> the, the propagation people know what works, mm -hmm. peat and perlite, and then the growers take that little thing and put it in a soil of compost and expect it to live. So we, you know, a lot of times we get in plumeris from our plumeris supplier, pull out a pot, there was only one root on it, and half of it was rotten. And we couldn't believe that they didn't understand what was going on in their plants. But uh, apparently they don't do this enough, they don't look at them. So we've dissected thousands and thousands and thousands of root balls over the last hmm. 20 years, 20 years, yeah, at least 20 years of doing this, um, to see what, what each grower's soil would do to their plants. So a lot of them, the roots would grow down to the center of the pot because there was this core of good soil down the center. And then they would go out to the edge and up the sides. They wouldn't go into that compost at all. They would be skirting around it. Top, sides, bottom, but they wouldn't live in it. And one pot, one grower who must have mixed their stuff with the tractor, one side of the pot was mud, the other side was compost. All the roots were in the mud. <laughs> they liked that better than the compost. And then another way to do this is use the stem of the plant and just vibrate it. And that takes most of that rest of it off. And that's usually good enough. You get 90% of it off. And we lost about maybe 20% roots on this doing that. And then get our so in this case, it's our top pot potting soil. And here I'm putting it back pot. I mean, you just put this right in the ground and use native soil, it's fine. Now, some plants, the roots are so drapey that you might have to put a little cone of dirt at the bottom and drape the roots over it so they separate a little bit. Sometimes I just saw, forget about it, you know, the plant will compensate. But it it's helps if the roots are separated from each other a little bit. Like you get citrus out of the pot, the roots are the shape of the container. It's real easy to get them in the pot again. So we'll 
do that. And then try to water it immediately because you don't want those roots to dry for any length of time. Although our potting soil generally has a little bit of moisture in it, so hold it for a while. A little bit of fertilizer, we use the time release the last six months, makes it easy for us. And now this plant will be fine the rest of its life. Um, but yeah, there's a number of plants that we would do. The flax plants look a lot better. We do that to them. Any other questions? So the drop method is what we use nowadays. Um, is that the pious what soil would you use for that? Top pot. That's growing in our top pot. Our gardenias are growing in our top pot. This is our gardenia. We started from a cutting a year ago. Uh, it's coming along real nice with the big leaves. Generally what we find is when we change the dirt, the leaves suddenly get a lot bigger. So we figure, okay, that must be a sign of healthier roots, bigger leaves. So the smaller leaves, you buy gardenias from growers, the leaf on the plants are like this big. They don't have any roots. If you see anything with brown edges, they don't have roots. Brown edge, you know, they, they're blaming salt burn. So you see the maples, I always said salt burn, you gotta flush the water through there. Ah, it just doesn't have any roots. They grow maples, Japanese maples are grown in pure bark. We don't get it. They just don't like that stuff. Um, any avocado you buy that's not from us would be in the wrong soil. Generally, when we changed avocados, when we got them from another grower, they would drop all their leaves. We couldn't stop them from dropping their leaves, but they, none of them would die. They would all recover and get going again. Citrus, really strong. We've not ever lost a single citrus tree drop due to change in the dirt, and it's like they don't even drop any leaves. And we'd stick them against the wall where they got a few hours of sun, mostly shade, for a couple weeks. And then they're fun. I, I did do one at my house once, uh, I was doing it in May when it was gloomy. I said, ah, don't have to shake this thing. And two weeks later, it was 80, no, a week later, it was 85 degrees and dropped all its foliage. But in two months, it was back to normal. It just grew everything back. So as long as they're dropping their leaves, they're fine. You don't have to worry about them. Silver sheens, we grow from scratch because they don't do well with the grower soil on them ever. Uh, let's see if I cover everything. So I have a question. If you have the maple leaves with the brown edges and they're in soil now and they still have brown edges, what can you do? Would you still dig them up and... Good question. So I have done this. So I had some, I bought some mango trees once from Florida. And before I knew about dirt, back in the early 90s, I put them all on the ground. And they're having some issues because everything in Florida, you can't send dirt to Florida. So they have them in pure pine bark. So here was the original root ball on the ground, here was the mango tree up here. So what I did is I dug with the hand trowel, try not to cut through roots near the surface, and dug out half the root ball and replaced it with our soil. Sure. And then six months later, I did the other side. So I replaced part of it at the time. Because you can destroy half the roots on the plant and won't flinch. So half the root ball at a time, you can just totally dig around it, replace that dirt. Six months later, they were on the other side of the place that there. We did that with all the mango trees in the yard. My wife had planted some gardenias at the time. Um, so, so I was able to do three of them this way. The one I didn't do died. Two of the three I did survived. So, again, gardenia is not the easiest to repair. This, that's one of the few plants I've ever had losses on, and it's like one third, one third or more losses on gardenias. And I would think lavender would be just as bad. I wouldn't try to chain fix a lavender plant. Um, would you use the acid mix for the gardenias then? We made our top pot specifically for gardenia. That was oh. our goal. We grow a gardenia in this soil for years and years, it works. What about plumerias? Uh, we use our top pot. What do you use the acid mix for besides the zanias and the gardenias? Yeah. And you can grow camellias in our top pot too. They're both acidic. It's just that our top pot won't shrink. This holds more water. 
the acid mix holds more water, more peat moss holds more water. So we use it on a lot of plants that need a lot of water. So we do grow our apple trees in it. We grow our um, pomegranates in it. We grow mulberries in it, figs in it, because they use water very quickly. Um, Yeah, we do our grapes too. Grapes are in our acid mix. Although if we run out of acid mix, sometimes we'll just put them in the other one. It's not a big deal. But that's how we generally operate. We put most stuff in our top pot. I mean, things grow a lot faster in our top pot. On plumeria, if we don't get two to three foot of growth a year, then we think there's something wrong with plumeria. Most of the areas we see grow less than a foot of uh, year. But when they're in the right soil, like if you have one in the ground, they'll grow three foot. They've been established in the ground in our top pot. You know, and our, our cactus and succulents water every day. I mean, the literature tries to tell us some plants will die when you water them too much. Plants do not like, do not hate water. It's just the soil. I mean, we see it all the time. Native plant growers keep telling about can't water this plant, you can't water this plant. It hates water in the summertime. It's like, no, they just don't want any water in the comp. They don't want compost in the water in the summertime. See, the problem with compost, when things rot, they usually rot in the summer. Uh, several things happen. The warmer water it is, the less oxygen it can hold. So you're already at a disadvantage in summertime. Water, warm water holds less oxygen. And then the other thing is compost decomposes faster when it's warm. So you got a pot full of compost and it's warm and you water a lot, there's less oxygen in the wintertime. So do you recommend watering early in the morning or late evening? When the... It doesn't matter. No. Now on leaves it matters, roots don't matter. On leaves, um, if a leaf stays wet for four hours or more, plants are susceptible to fungus on the leaves. Uh, four hours of water sitting there, not hitting it, but actually Laying a drop of water sitting on this leaf will can catch a fungus. It takes spores, fungus spores, uh, half of the people to germinate in a still drop of water that sits there for four hours to get into the leaf. If the water keeps moving, it doesn't hurt them. Uh, water dries off within a couple hours, it's not no, no damage at all. So you can water, I, I used to tell people to water between mid, no, mid morning and noon. If you want to be safe around rows, say tomato plants, you don't want the leaves wet all day. Because if you water too late after noon, then sometimes it stays wet all night. Uh, also in the afternoon, the wind picks up, the water tends to be blown areas where it's not supposed to go. So mid-morning to noon is a good time for me, or you know, this time of year, six o'clock in the morning, sun's already out, it's fine. It'll dry off pretty fast. June bloom can be a problem, it can stay wet all day. So you would use the topsoil for uh, pineapple, guava, and citrus also? Yes. And you can always, a lot of people like to add sand to our acid mix, half and half. And that's perfect soil too. You can add real dirt to our soil. Uh, I would tell you about 20% real dirt from the ground will hold a lot more water than our potting soil will. I wouldn't go too much over. We've gone to 40%, but it looks strange because the water will sit there all day. I mean, one, one of the first times we started making our own soil for our roses, we made it 40% sandy loam. So we watered them, and the water would sit there in the pot all day long. <laughs> the little ponds. The roses looked fine. <laughs> they didn't mind having that pond there. Uh, but it looks strange to our customers to have them sitting in water. So we made it down, we took the, the sandy loam content of our, of our nursery container mix down to 20%. At that point, it drained faster. So 20% grilled dirt from the ground. If you've got a lot of clay in it, don't use more than 10%. But that will help it hold more water without any disadvantages, really. It might grow a little bit slower, but it'll still grow faster than well on the ground. So yeah, you want things to grow fast. The more oxygen gets your roots, the more water you get your roots, the more fertilizer you get to the plant, the faster and bigger it will grow. That's the key to growing plants. That's why, that's why they grow plants in clay pellets. A lot of oxygen around the roots. Uh, 
They water them every few hours. They get plenty of water to the roots. Uh, they're fertilizing the water, so the example fertilizer. So oxygen to the roots seems to be the main thing we're missing. It used to be carbon dioxide. They would actually fill the uh, greenhouse with carbon dioxide to make the plants grow faster. The carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is getting so high, the plants are just and naturally growing a lot faster than they used to. So it's oxygen to the roots being the key to growing anything. You get the oxygen down there, you got sandy soil, you got good looking plants no matter what. So next week we'll cover a little more about watering. Uh, how to water efficiently, fertilizers, uh, and some other rules we go by when we plant plants in the garden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Well, you can do what Arbor's do. Arbor's do what Goldberg